order now. Let's uh, call to order a regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, to December the 11th to order. If I could ask everyone to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of So our um, agenda tonight, we will open it up for public comment. Um, we've got substantial student recognition, it looks like, which is great. Uh, we'll have updates from our student school board reps, uh, superintendent's report, which includes good news, the LHS pool. Um, we have a presentation on a later start time task force update. Uh, there's a uh, donation acknowledgement and a uh, summary of the four requests. Then we'll approve the consent vote agenda, which we reviewed earlier this evening. Um, updates from program and personnel and facilities and finance. Um, Scott, any further update on property? Not right now. Okay. See y'all? Nothing? All right. I as Jim. Okay. Um, then we will have a brief executive session tonight. We won't be taking any action after that executive session, so um, no action after we convene that session. All right, anything else? All right, anybody from the public who would like to speak tonight? All right, let me take that. Um, then let's move on to the recognition. All right, well, good evening. Uh, it's an exciting night tonight to have uh, many of our athletes here from uh, both schools. And we're going to start with our swimming program. At Vernon Hills, we have had the most successful swim season uh, ever. <coughs> so exciting times here for our female swim and dive, uh, dive for sure. And so uh, our head coach, Kendrick Greenwald, is going to come up here and talk. Uh, also, Libertyville has continued many years of uh, great success in their female swim and dive program as well. Their head coach is not available tonight, so uh, Kendrick is also going to talk about Emma. Right, Emma? Yeah. From Libertyville as well. So these four will be honored by Coach Greenwell. Thanks. Did you jump? Um, first up, our, our first um, finalist actually just arrived back being out of town. Um, her performance this year was good enough to earn her um, the opportunity to swim at the Junior National Meet, which was at Iowa City, Iowa. Did a phenomenal job. Uh, this young lady is, has just come such a long way with her swimming and continues to grow and um, get faster and faster every year and just look forward to what she can accomplish next year as a senior. And so I'd like to call up uh, junior Drew Peterite, who was 11th in the 50 freestyle. Next up, um, we are very fortunate with the Vernon Hills uh, Girls Swimming and Diving Program to be very youthful, and um, this next um, <coughs> state finalist really speaks to that youth. Uh, she is truly one of the um, one of the the best incoming freshmen that we've ever had, and, and really reminds me of one of our program's best swimmers um, in the history of the program. This young lady earned a ninth place finish in the 200-yard freestyle, and um, no doubt will be here. Um, being represented, hopefully representing our swim team um, again for years to come. So freshman Casey Crafty. Um, and then the last young lady from Vernon Hills High School that I'd like to speak about um, is a young lady who, uh, you know, I've bragged about this many times over, um, is, our, is our diver here being represented. And this young lady's only been competing in diving for one year. Now she comes into the program with a significant um, gymnastics pedigree, which certainly helps in the crossover, um, but it's not an easy transition. And after only a year, this young lady um, earned a third place finish at this year's state meet. So sophomore Allie Landis. Lastly, as awkward as it might seem that a Vernon Hills um, teacher and coach is, is honoring Libertyville swimmer, I was fortunate enough to have met Aunt, um, Emma Gleason um, as an 11 or 12 year old 
um, with my affiliation with the local swim club. And so I've known Emma for uh, quite some time and to see her grow, um, not only as an athlete, but she's just an incredible person. And I've told her many times over how jealous I am um, that I don't have a young lady like her on my program. Um, did a phenomenal job, really improved tremendously this high school season to earn herself, remind me, was it? An eighth place finish in the 100 yard butterfly, um, sophomore Miss Emma Gleason. <laughs> And to continue, uh, this is like deja vu all over again. Our uh, girls cross country team just continues to kill it year over year. They have uh, proven uh, their abilities and uh, their tenacity on the cross country course. Uh, this year was no different. And uh, I said last year at this meeting, and I'll say it again, this is uh, by all aspects uh, one of the most, if not the most healthy program uh, in the building. When you look at the number of kids in participation, uh, their results year over year, uh, and uh, we, we really love their coaching staff as well. So uh, let me introduce uh, head coach um, Suzanne Curry. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam, for those um, kind words. Um, Obviously the program would not be what it is without, first of all, the kids. Um, we, get great, we attract great kids. Um, they come from great parents. Um, these guys know that I've said it a million times that um, I appreciate the, the group that they give us every year. Um, I wanna thank you guys for welcoming us and um, recognizing us again because the work that these kids put in is tremendous. Um, and to be here for the third time in a row, four times in five years, um, several of these girls have their names on three of those trophies. So um, many of them are juniors this year, so we're going to be um, working our way out of there, but we're hoping that um, we're right back here next year um, with their names on maybe a bigger trophy next year. So um, I'll introduce them uh, one at a time. First up, we have Lily Blaze. She's a sophomore. Uh, Caitlin Doler is a junior with her name um, on three trophies. Hannah Ray is another junior. Another junior, Ryan Schofield. Um, finally, a sophomore, Carly Sear. Another junior, Vivian Chai. Junior, Katie Wilkowski. Uh, her sister, Leah Wilkowski, twin sister. And another junior, Ellie Zazek. And a first timer on the trophy, sophomore Bryn Zimke. Junior that couldn't be here tonight, uh, Peyton Mikowski. And last, we have our only senior that we have to say goodbye to, and 
she's had an outstanding career. Um, she just finished, um, well, she ran in four state meets, three-time all-state all athlete. This year she finished 11th in state. Um, she's been an amazing part of our program, and, um, you know, she's led these guys throughout, and so we're looking for leadership um, from these guys to carry on, but we're going to miss her a ton, and that's Lauren Katz. this is our favorite thing to do. So we all work together over the years so the kids can be successful, right? So this is always ex exciting and it's the most fun thing that the board does and certainly we do as district and building administrators. Having said that, we know that uh, the young ladies here tonight have been su successful for a variety of reasons, but uh, the huge reason is the support that they've received at home and from family and friends and uh, you working with them over a period of time and providing them support and guidance and assistance in their journeys along the way. So before you all leave tonight, we'd like all the parents and family members to stand up and let's give them all a round of applause. Come on, thank you all. So we just want to say thanks to all of you. Now, with that done, you are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the morning. Uh, however, if you want to exit stage left or right, we, uh, you won't hurt our feelings. Okay, so we'll leave that up to you. So thanks for coming. Congratulations. Thank you. to help the families bring the gifts to their car 
and it's amazing to just see how like thankful they are. So that was really awesome. And then actually the day before that, there was a <coughs> senior dinner for <coughs> seniors in the community that was hosted by the school and NHS. And after that, uh, a lot of the seniors go to the choir concert. So there was a choir concert on Tuesday as well as Wednesday. And it featured all the traditions with like the candlelit processional and they always sing the hallelujah chorus. And then as well, seniors got to like shoot off confetti cannons during one of their songs, which was pretty cool. I was in choir, so that was like a great experience. <laughs> all right. So um, Hot Chocolate Friday started at LHS. Um, it is a great way and a fun way to keep students motivated and smiling through the last push of the semester, and we really appreciate it. Um, D128 students selected for all state ensembles, so LHS and VHHS students selected for the Illinois Music Educators all state ensembles. So students will rehearse and perform with a guest conductor and students from across the state from January 24th to January 27th for high school um, musicians being selected to the IMEC State Fifth Festival is the highest individual honor they can receive, and Kelsey actually received it, so good job to her. And then um, LHS art students had their artwork featured in the art show Thursday, November 30th, and students were invited to walk through the main gym to admire an array of creations from LHS art students. Um, in the evening, the art show was open again for people from the public to come in and purchase various pieces of art. And then also a college board selected IHS out of the pool of 447 high schools for the 8th Annual Advanced Placement Honor Roll. So the significance of this award is to recognize districts who have improved, improved access to AP coursework while maintaining or increasing the percentage of students earning scores of 3 or higher on any AP exams. So this is a really big honor for um, our high school. And then Curie Cats, which is like a coding cats or like STEM for um, girls at Libertyville High School, connects with um, LHS alum um, Gwen Shotwell. So on Thursday, December 7th, the LHS Curie Cats Women in STEM Club hosted a conference call with Gwen Shotwell, LHS 1982 graduate and president and CEO of SpaceX. So that was really cool to see. Um, yeah. That's it. <laughs> um, all right, so we have our all-state musicians heading down to Peoria in January. From orchestra, we have Ariel Cha and Nikki Medanovich. And then from band, we have Bobby Black, Joshua Liu, and Cece Gao. From choir, we have Donnelly Black, Kaylee Brand, Kelsey Carita, and Jillian Bose. Um, about two weeks ago, we had the Clothesline Project in our gym where um, students from all of our gym periods were invited to the main gym to um, witness the Clothes Iron Project that was introduced by a couple of its members. Basically, the Clothes Iron Project is created by survivors of domestic abuse all over the world, and it reminds people about the amount of violent statistics that often go ignored, um, and to educate the community that help is available. Sounds were echoed in the gym to represent instances of abuse as students read, st as students read the shirts. Um, our Screenagers movie received um, about 200 people in attendance to watch this documentary on what experts have to say about appropriate technology use. And the variety show, we had senior Jordan Bunning, who won it with her stellar rendition of the Napoleon Dynamite. Our holiday music concert is this Thursday, featuring the symphony orchestra and choirs. There are two performances, one at 6 and one at 8 p.m. Our very own senior, I'm Operande, um, won the Congressional App Challenge with his mobile application called Go Green. And our Team New Table Chat initiative was very well received by students and staff um, a couple of weeks ago. Our first talk was about a later start time for school, and some feedback was that students didn't like the idea of, oh, students liked the idea of sleeping later. Um, some students didn't want to get out of school too late, so they were worried about that, and they were also worried that shorter periods would result in more work at home. They, would also, they were also concerned that after school events would run, would run really late, but we have more chats planned for the future on topics like homework loads, school spirit, school culture, and respect. We also have more teachers who are using problem-based learning initiatives that include presentations to authentic audiences. So for example, our government classes, classes had the civic engagement fair, and our college preparatory writing class made school improvement presentations. So overall, students were really appreciative to have this opportunity to, opportunity to basically explore um, their opportunities to create change in their own communities. 
All right. Um, so last month, we kind of gave you guys an overview about the Lucy Light campaign that our VH Give Club was launching to provide light with these devices called Lucy Lights to our sister school in Uganda. And we went above and beyond and exceeded our goals um, from classroom donations, staff donations, our variety show ticket sales, and our Change for Change class competition. We raised a total of $4,285.81, which allowed us to purchase a Lucy Light for every student, staff member, and woman in the literacy program at St. Jerome in Uganda. And the total of lights that we purchased was 282, and we had leftover money, so we had $1,500 raised as a leftover, and we donated that to the school to help them purchase teacher resources, including books and curriculum to help prepare the students um, for the national test that they all need to take to qualify for high schools down in Uganda. Um, and then this Friday, we actually have our next BH gift um, video with the theme of BH Respect Diversity. And the executive board, Ms. Beagle, Mr. Friedrich, Ms. Carroll, and Mr. Phelan prepared a video with interviews of students similar to that of Humans of New York. We called it Humans of VH. Um, the goal is to emphasize diversity in our school community and highlighting that we need to respect all our similarities and differences. Um, the Chamber Choir finished its season after caroling in the community this past month, feeding my starving children, Brookdale, the senior assistant home, and we also came to the district office. Um, and we all had our magical dessert concert at the Byron Colby Barn, and it was a success. This Wednesday, we're headed down to the city to sing on WLS, 8.90 a.m., from 6.45 to 7.45 a.m., and also next week, we'll be going to WGN at 8.15. Um, and then we celebrated two groups of outstanding people this month, staff members, 10 staff members received You Make a Difference, and they were nominated by their peers, chosen on the basis of going above and beyond and helping students and their families, supporting their colleagues, and upholding the values of our school. And those winners were Barb Doble, Mike McCallieu, Julie Schroeder, Suzanne Curry, Christy Rivas, Brandon Waters, Craig Baumgars, Bo Warmbold, Radhika Joshi, and Doug Gerber. And also we recognize students at the Cougar Class Act Award, which has similar goals as well, but recognizing students. And then a, lastly, a student written and directed musical of 2008 was selected to perform at the Illinois High School Theater Fest down at Illinois State University in January. So they were selected out of uh, many schools that apply over the state and have two performances down there. That's cool, there's some great stuff in it. Yeah, great job. Great. So I just ask, so um, upcoming events here, this late start presentation, they haven't seen that yet, I would imagine? Right. Okay, so normally we could say you're more than welcome to leave if you'd like, but I would highly encourage you tonight to stay. You might be interested in the next topic. Okay, um, okay great job. <laughs> one other, one, one other thing. No pressure there, buddy. Now <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, I dare you to leave. Um, the other thing is the diversity video, right, mm -hmm. that you're gonna see? If we could get a link to it or show it in a future session, I wouldn't mind seeing it. I think it'd be uh, good for all of us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you remember, uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but we have a first ever Student Diversity Council, uh, and that council was highly involved with kind of the formation of this VH Unite initiative, and then specifically this video. Uh, she mentioned several, I should mention Kevin Phelan is another one who was a speaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great news. Yeah, fantastic. All right, uh, superintendent's report. Okay, we have some more good news, no surprise. Uh, I will say before we start good news this evening that uh, one of the highlights of our year at district office is when the VHHS choir comes over with Mr. Little to sing to us. Um, it just sets the table for the holiday season. They're just amazing every single year, so. Yeah. so. I, you know, let me add to that. Actually, I was at the uh, Pads Homeless Shelter at our church last Thursday. Or last Thursday, Thursday, fifth week in November. I know it's fifth week. Um, and they were singing there as well. Um, and just kind of warmed the hearts of all those poor people that didn't have a place to stay. So um, it was great. I, unfortunately, I missed the performance because it was just before my shift started, but I did see Jeremy there, and you know what a wonderful thing to, to hear that they had just sent to all the homeless people. Now, church, sorry. So the next time Dr. Gertie's around, you can pull him into the group. 
<laughs> that would actually not help your cause. <laughs> <Just so you know. laughs> okay, uh, more good news to share. D District 128 is excited to announce that the College Board has selected and recognized District 128 as one of just 447 school districts in the entire United States and Canada for the 8th Annual Advanced Placement Honor Roll. According to the College Board, the significance of the AP Honor Roll distinction is that it recognizes districts that have simultaneously increased access to AP coursework <laughs> while maintaining or increasing the percentage of students earning scores of three or higher. Honor Roll districts defy the expectation that expanding <coughs> access to AP automatically results in a decline in the percentage of exams earning scores of three or better. So congratulations to our building administrators and teacher support staff, uh, district administration, and of course the board for their support of uh, our work in the district. We're very proud uh, of everyone for their efforts. VHHS junior Max Yu earned a perfect 36 on his ACT test. According to ACT, his achievement is both uh, significant and rare. On average, only about one-tenth of one percent of all test takers earn the top score. Among U.S. high school graduates in the class of 2017, just uh, 2,760 out of over 2 million who took the test earned a composite score of 36, so congratulations to Max. 15 VHHS students received the December Ellen Swick Cougar Class Act Award. Recipients were nominated for going above and beyond, for being compassionate and, and, and encouraging individuals, and for being exceptional representatives of the Cougar values. Congratulations to all recipients. Uh, Rosie Mayling, uh, Lee Judea, Eric Panea, uh, Ryan Schofeld, uh, Jimmy McDonald, Brian Shim, Kevin Diaz, Dylan Hoffman, Owen Christensen, Jasmine King, Brian Lauman, Jessica Ripes, uh, Chandra Lambana, uh, Lily Prokotsky, and uh, Ritva Ramish. More than 200 senior, senior residents of District 128 joined us for annual holiday dinner and concert at LHS. We appreciate the continued support of our senior residents. Special shout out to the members of the LHS National Honor Society for helping serve our special guests. We couldn't do it without you. And of course, we had the companion uh, dinner prior to Thanksgiving uh, at Vernon Hills High School, which was you know, wildly successful once again. The following LHS and VHHS students were selected for the Illinois Music Educators All-State Ensembles from LHS. Melissa Manich in band, Tara D'Souza in composition, Eloise Heights in band, Meredith Golden in band, David Lee, clarinet, Matt Newberger, orchestra, um, Ainsley Lounsbury, FMES, Lauren Randolph, choir, Alexandria Hibbert Brown for choir, Paul uh, Nauman, choir, and Beck Gantos for orchestra from VHHS. Ariel Cha in violin, Jillian Bose in voice, Kelsey Carrido in voice, Kaylee Brand in voice, Joshua Liu, alto saxophone, Bobby Black, tuba, Nikki uh, Mendanovic, Pic uh, Piccolo, uh, Denali Black, voice, and Cece Gao, the flute. Students will rehearse and perform with a guest conductor and students from across the state on January 24th to 27th for high school musicians. Being selected to the IMEA State Festival is the highest individual honor they can receive. Congratulations to LHS students Liam Tucker and Nathan John who earned perfect scores at the NSML Mathematics Contest on December 7th at Warren Township High School. The team scored second overall. The D128 Special Olympians have been very busy lately competing and bringing home additional honors. Three athletes competed in the Northern Bowling Sectional in Rockford. They battled hard and ended up with the following results. Anna Scholler finished with a silver. Uh, Nathan <coughs> Ferrara finished in fourth, and Chris DeRose finished in fourth. The floor hockey team finished third in Division Three at the state floor hockey tournament. The team lost in the first game 6-1 to state champion Orland Owls, but bounced back to beat Shabona Park 7-4 to take home the bronze medal. Team members are Johnny O'Connor, Nathan Ferrara, Anthony Berktold, Joseph Mahler, Mallory Marvin, Mason Reyes, Alexa Donato, Chris DeRose, Anna Scholler, Vinny Roberts, Tristan Hidalgo, uh, Charlie Halperin, Chris Morosin, and Shaw Karanen. 
The basketball teams are also off and running. The orange team has won one, losing to Evanston High School, but beating Jacobs High School. And blue team is 0-1, having lost a tough one to Jacobs. Congratulations to LHS Model UN delegates who participated in the Stanford Model United Nations Conference in November. Izzy Greenberg won Best Research for her representation of Ajax the Lesser in the JCC Greek Committee. Tony Cardinal won Honorable Mention as uh, Diaphobus and Trojan Wars Council Leah Hartung won Honorable Mention for representing Christopher Lydell in the National Cyber Convention. And Drew Hopkins won Outstanding Delegate for his representation of Madagascar in the UN Climate Change Convention. Congratulations also go to Model UN Delegate Olivia Galvin for winning honorable mention in the Cabinet of the USSR 1948 at the Chicago International Model UN Conference. The team is coached by Matt Thompson and Lauren Pottas. The following LHS students have been recognized, as mentioned earlier, by the Illinois Association of Teachers of English for their prose and poetry writing. Uh, Anna Lagutke, first place for Unrequited. Anna also earned first place recognition last year. Ashley Pignoni, first place for Doors to Amaranth. An honorable mention for Beware of Laura and Ashley. And Christine Zhang, uh, honorable mention for Life. Uh, their work has been published in the 2016-17 IATE Bulletin. Their work was submitted by their teachers, Karen Lamastri and Ann Singleton. So we want to take the opportunity again to thank uh, all of our students and the staff that work with them for uh, just the incredible efforts academically, student activities, athletics, and maybe most important in community service. So um, our students just do a phenomenal job and the adults that work with them. So great work and keep it up. Always look forward to reporting out on your success. Okay, next on the superintendent's report tonight is the LHS pool update. And Mark, if you want to just uh, take a minute and update us on where we're at right now. Yes, Brent, uh, on the board. Um, we're moving forward at uh, Libertyville High School with the pool project. Uh, we have several footings in. Um, and uh, foundation walls have uh, gone up on the south side of uh, uh, where the building is going to be. Um, we're progressing around, getting footings in, and um, uh, sometime this week we will start uh, piping for the pool vessel itself um, and then start pouring concrete. What's the weather, excuse me, the weather risk? Uh, the weather risk, we've got blankets for cold weather. Um, so they've been covering the ground, keep frost out there, digging as we go along. Um, so they're getting down uh, uh, to the ground, so not to uh, let the frost in the ground. Um, so our biggest uh, hurdle is snow, snowfall. Um, once there's, we get a lot of snow, uh, it's removal of the snow from the site. It'll make it harder to work. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, Mark, just a question. So are we on budget still? Yes, at this time we are on budget. And are we still planning spring of 2019? Yes, we're still planning for spring of 2019. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, great. Uh, next on the superintendent's report uh, tonight, as the board is aware, and uh, I believe the community has become aware, that um, over the past uh, 12 to 18 months, the district has been investigating uh, the possibility of starting uh, school later uh, next year. And um, Rita has worked with an integrated group that has included administrators, teachers, parents, and um, students um, over the past few months. And uh, we've done a couple of uh, brief updates to the board, and uh, Rita's going to do uh, an update tonight and put some additional context to the work the group has done. Thank you, Brennan. So, um, as you know, when we reported in October, we provided background on the formation of the Later Start Time Task Force and the work that uh, the task force explored related to uh, student um, start and end time of the school day as, whether, as well as the other factors that impact a student's health and well-being. Um, our task force consisted of 35 members, one of whom is Madison, who's with us tonight. 
Um, those 35 members included six uh, students, six parents, 13 educators representing classroom teachers, learning support team members, our uh, health and wellness coordinators and activity directors, and 10 administrators from both Libertyville High School, Vernon Hills High School, and the district office. And we came together uh, four times beginning in October, um, met October through November, to study the issue of uh, starting the school day later. Um, we reviewed research related to the impact of that later start time on student health and well-being, as well as academic achievement. And we studied various ways of implementing a later start time. So tonight, we're ready to share with you the task force findings. And um, we understand that the, the findings of the task force represent just that, that these findings will be subject to collective bargaining and to your approval. Um, but we wanted to provide you with a report that uh, summarized our findings and recommended a specific uh, start and end time for the school day, as well as the length of instructional periods. The committee thought that it was really important to recognize before sharing any recommended schedule that we, we really do recognize that there are a number of factors beyond the start time of the school day that impact the student's health and well-being. And we thought it was important as a task force to weigh in on those other factors and to share some recommendations related to them. So um, first, in, or, in terms of the context related to um, the start time, Task Force members were concerned about the balance in students' lives. And we thought it was important to acknowledge that if we push the start time back a little bit later, that that in and of itself will not necessarily provide students with additional sleep time, the recommended um, nine plus hours that a student uh, should have in order to perform well in high school. So um, our recommendations included the notion that everyone involved in supporting student decision making should be on the same page in terms of recommending balance when selecting schedules, when uh, making decisions about participating in extracurricular activities. We've heard from so many colleges and universities that they are looking for depth in student performance and passion rather than a breadth of experience. It's not necessary for students to take every AP course that we offer, right? But to have some experience in advanced placement courses is beneficial. So the task force uh, recommends that we consider balance, that um, we also um, acknowledge that sometimes when we're working with students, you know, we think about our work with students rather than their entire day and the work that they experience as a result of all of the things that they do during the course of the day. So we recommend that this issue of balance be one that as a school community we continue to discuss and work on um, in addition to considering a later start time. The second topic that we uh, discussed was that when we reviewed research related to other districts that had implemented later start times. Some of those districts developed guidelines for uh, before and after school activities, the length of those activities, the number of sessions that are scheduled. And we recommend that this uh, topic be explored uh, along with the later start time. So um, the, um, the other concern expressed by members of the task force um, was that when you move to a later start time, the purpose of doing that is defeated if we pile up lots of before school activities for students. And so we recommend that uh, we, we understand that time and space constraints um, require scheduling some practices before school, but if the decision is made to push this time uh, later, that we're really conscious of the number and kinds of activities that we schedule prior to the official start of the school day as well. Next, we talked about homework and the impact uh, that homework has on a student's schedule. And we thought it was important that as a school community, we engage in conversations about the purpose of homework that is assigned, the length of those homework assignments, the learning goals associated with them, alternatives to homework, um, consistency in, in how homework is assigned across similar courses. 
um, and other topics related to this issue of homework that we continue to discuss together as a school community, and we take that into consideration related to start time as well. Um, finally, we looked at a zero hour early bird courses, those courses that begin prior to the start of the school day. And um, most of the task force, the vast majority of the members, believe that it was important that we continue to offer these zero hour and early bird courses um, to provide flexibility to students and parents, as well as to um, face the, the reality of space constraints with science labs and other things that are used throughout the day. So we have some zero hour PE classes that meet, we have, which is a full period earlier than the start of the school day, and we have some courses, science lab courses, AP courses that are a period and a half that start a half a period um, before the school day and then finish at the end of the official first period. So the recommendation of the task force is, while that would require some students to come in earlier than the start time we're recommending, that it's a necessity to provide for flexibility for students and to uh, recognize the space constraints that we have with science labs. We did. Can I ask one question? Sure. There? So the one, two, three, four bullet points. Some members oppose the. Um, yeah, sorry. Stuff. Yeah. So what was their what was their recommended solution to the problem? Um, there, there was not an alternative to discussed. Um, there was just a, a you know. A, we wanted to be sure that we reported all the conversations accurately that took place among task force members. So those who had a strong philosophical bent that if we're saying that it's healthy for students to begin their day at 8.30 or later, then we shouldn't be scheduling anything prior to that. We shouldn't be scheduling any classes, any practices, anything. But the majority of the task force members recognized, well, ideally, students you know, should start at a later time. Um, but when you follow the research, when you look at recommendations of the research, that speaks to what is best for the majority of students. But there, in any research, there are outliers to that, right? And so for some students, um, having the opportunity to, to fit a course into their schedule because they're able to take their PE early, uh, we recognize that it's the right of those students and parents to make those decisions. So those who opposed starting anything prior to our recommended start time um, recognized the constraints with space, but thought it was important to hear, adhere to that belief that if this is good for all kids, we should make it true for all kids in every circumstance. And, the, and others said we, we have to be flexible with that. How many um, courses students are actually participating right now, or do you have that information in zero hour early learning? Yeah, so we have. Um, yeah, we have a section of zero hour PE at each school. So and, one, um, how many kids is that? Six, 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 two six sections zero. at Vernon Hills and one section at Libertyville. So approximately 60 students mm -hmm. and 30 at Libertyville. Um, and then we have the early bird labs that begin before the school day with uh, two sections at Libertyville currently and one section at Vernon Hills currently. So that's like 60. 24. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And again, that's because the task force talked a lot about the, the <coughs> lab usage. The, the labs are booked throughout the school day, every period of the school day. And so, in order to fit in the number of AP classes that we have, it's, it's impossible to do that without starting <coughs> some earlier. And is, that, is that a problem that goes away with more labs, or is that just the nature of the experiments? They got to like use two periods to do those things. Most. Uh, all area districts that I know offer um, a period and a half for their lab AP science classes, and that is because of the necessity of having a longer block of time to schedule the labs that are required for those AP courses. So that was where my question was going. So other districts that you benchmark, look at, do they also start earlier on their labs? The vast majority of AP classes are the right vast now. majority of districts have a period and a half for their AP classes. Not all districts um, have an early bird offering, many do, but there are those 
who, you know, who can schedule all of their AP classes within their existing lab space and don't offer that. The other thing that that does for students is provide a full lunch during the school day. Um, and I know students who take the AP lab classes um, sometimes appreciate having that early bird schedule so that they have a break during their day where they have a full uh, lunch period like other students do. Kelsey's and nodding it, her head, yes? And, uh, the other thing about the, um, having a, a few PE offerings, and again, the number of students that we have out of 3,400 students percentage-wise, it's pretty small um, overall. If you have a student that takes band, for example, they can never, ever take an elective while they're in high school. So the early bird <coughs> option allows them another period during the day to take um, a, an elective class that they might like to take, uh, or even another academic class. Um, yeah, there are, there are some things that we offer that are only offered in a, sp a specific period during the school day, and so, you know, when students have conflicts, uh, they want to take two things that are offered in limited ways, that zero hour offers flexibility to fit something into their schedule that they might not otherwise be able so to. So the do. early labs today at LHS start at what time? So 705 today. Yeah, but you'll see what we're recommending in the and future. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting I'm holding everyone in suspense to get to the recommended. That's happening today, so those early labs now also start earlier in the, or later yeah. in the day right. under your recommendation. This, right. this, is a, this is a current practice that our recommendation pushes to that same half period before our later yeah, start gets time. Pushed out. Everything gets pushed out. Okay. There, there, we did have a really interesting and healthy discussion about, you know, when we said <laughs> that uh, our recommendations don't work for every single student and we should provide flexibility, we had a lengthy conversation about ninth period and would that work for us and we just thought at the present time based on our research of who is taking zero hour and early birth, that so many of those students are involved in after school activities that would prohibit them from being able to schedule a ninth period that occurred after our recommended uh, end time. So while we talked about a ninth period option, we didn't see that as a viable replacement for or addition to zero hour. So just, I want to make sure I understand, zero hour, the only zero hour classes are PE classes. Yeah. No, well, zero well, is advanced lab. Well, no, so no there's, there's, early there's, bird. There, early, so oh. the, our no. terminology is a little off. I'm okay. using the term zero hour for the full period okay. prior to. Oh, those are only PE. Um, yeah, <coughs> yes, but I think at, at Vernon Hills, everything is referred to well, as. You're right. Or, it, you're it's right. We have different right. terminology. But what you're saying is correct. A whole period. Those are only I can't take honors literature as a no. zero hour class. Right, right. And so that was the recommendation of the task force as well, that um, you know, the, 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 they were assuming that we would not begin to recommend a lot of additional zero hour or early bird course offerings. And there lies my Yeah, so right, off, yes. We, will not, we control that. Yes. Right. We do. We, other than when parents and the community starts because again, we're in a race to excellence in this district, and that's why we're stressed, many kids are stressed out. And so, one of, and again, I'm glad, and again, I'm glad of what you said as well, but I know a lot of board members, and we, we started the discussion about the stress levels. Sure. And now we're giving an opportunity, another block of time here for people to think that they perhaps can fill it with something else. That was a very real concern of members of the task force, including parents on the task force, students on the task force, Madison can attest to that. We had many conversations about this concern that we, we really wanted to make it clear that we didn't recommend any kind of piling on of lots of different opportunities and courses and um, other things prior to the school day. But some members of the task force did point out that, you know, there will be times when things will have to be scheduled because we simply don't have any other space available um, during some practice seasons to fit those practices in after school. So the task force was not recommending the elimination of all after school. We tried to take a balanced approach to this too. 
There will be some necessity of having things before school to provide students with flexibility, but the recommendation was not to pile those things on because suddenly we had newfound time. So Kevin, I think to your question, and, and let me say this publicly on camera for all of us, so on behalf of all of us, okay. I think the gist of your real, real question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is would there be some possibility to start offering, you know, like a full curriculum in the morning? So English or a math class or some other class now that we'll have some space in the morning. And so my response earlier was we control that. So first of all, we, we have a scheduling process that we go through here that uh, comes from the building up to district office and then we work with John and Tom um, at district office. So if we were going to look to, to add possibly something, there would have to be a rationale for that. They would have to convince us of that and we would have a conversation with all of you about that. So I would say if as a board, you're kind of willing to help us hold the line Sure. If, if people come and say, nope, this is an opportunity now, we want you to offer 10 other classes in the morning, if you guys will stand with us, which I know you will, that's a rhetorical statement there, um, then uh, we will continue to do what we've been doing for a long time here, and that is really to delimit uh, the possibilities in the morning to things that we absolutely have to do for, for space and also to give students some flexibility in their schedule. Where's, uh, where's Creek? Yeah. 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 And, and we, we also are, don't have the money to just have staff to sit there and teach back. overloads for those periods. Well, and, and we've done. Are requesting them. That's I, a budgetary concern. You know, the, thir the 13 years I've been here, we, we've had zero hour in early bird. And what we are reporting out tonight is what we had 13 years ago when I started here. So there, there's been a good system of control and some understanding beyond this conversation, but it dovetails nicely into this conversation uh, in terms of doing that. So uh, we will do quality control on that. We take, obviously, you know, our history demonstrates we, we take that very seriously. Um, but of course, there may always be members of the community who want us to offer another class or something in the morning, uh, but that would certainly have to go through, you know, a pretty extensive review process for for us to say we're, we want to offer that class. Thank you. You know, we yeah. thank you for your questions as well because they really, your questions really do reflect the very deep conversations yep. that we had in the task force meetings. And they, they reflect the concerns of parents and uh, others in the task force who really want to ensure this balance. In fact, when we started the task force, we said, you know, there are, there are things um, that the task force will not fully resolve and, and cannot do other than to make a recommendation regarding start and end time. And many task force members just felt like they couldn't move on until we put some of these things in pa on paper um, related to the later start time as well. So we did that first and then we finalized, now what is our recommended schedule? So that's why the recommended schedule appears near the end of the presentation and here it is. So. Um, the vast majority of the task force members um, had a strong sentiment about pushing the start day as late as possible without ending the school day so late as to impact after school activities in a negative way. And um, after reviewing several suggested schedules, um, the task force recommends a schedule with a school start time of 8.45 uh, 45 minute class periods and an end time of 325. Uh, one of the class periods is extended uh, five minutes per second period because we're, we're starting a little bit later so lunches will start a little bit earlier. So five minutes on second period for announcements as we presently do. We looked at announcements, we looked at passing periods, what can we do to kind of squeeze more time out of a later start time schedule um, and, and uh, again, based on our study, based on deep conversations, the strong sentiment in the room was to go as late as possible while still um, affording the opportunity for after school activities to not, you know, students to not have to leave eighth period classes to get to events, things to not start too late at the end of the school day. Um, so in, in doing that, uh, we're recommending that every uh, school day begins at the same time, Monday through Friday 
and uh, those 45 minute class periods result in um, a 45 minute average class time per week rather than the 48 minute average that we presently have with our late start Wednesday. What do we have on the other four days? Pardon me? So we currently have 50 minute class we're going periods. From, for the from 50. Time, no, we're going to have a 50 minute. Not a, yeah, so the average class time per week on our present schedule is 48 minutes, which is the 50-minute class periods Monday, Tuesday. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, the class periods are 48 minutes? Are 50 minutes. 50. No, so it's so only one day. So one day. So we're comparing it to just the Wednesday of late start, not to the... No, no, the average. So the Wednesday late start is a shorter... Oh, how long are those? Those are 40, 40, 40 minutes 40. presently, oh, right? Oh, yeah, thank yeah. You. Yeah. So, so what the, we did was average out the time. So, you know, presently we have four 50-minute classes, one 40-minute class, and we're recommending that we move to five 45-minute classes per week. You said the vast majority approved of A. Uh, what, yeah. what number out of the 35 is that? We did not. Um, we did not take up a count. We had a few people who who said that. Um, they would prefer to present an alternative, and the task force agreed that it was a good idea to, to present an alternative. We also had, um, you know, we didn't have all 35 members weighing in on every decision. So we, we had conversations, your report represents those conversations, but we did not tally um, with any kind of vote the feelings of, of the membership. So what when we completed our work, we agreed that we would share this recommended schedule, we would share the alternative schedule, and this report that you're reviewing was shared with all task members for their approval before we shared it with you. And, and Rio, I think we can take that one step further. We, the um, district leadership team has also reviewed this, um, yeah. and this is our recommended schedule after looking at the work that the group uh, did because it pushes us later, about right. 15 minutes later than the other schedule. Right. Uh, it still uh, makes it workable at the end of the day for the travel that we have to do, particularly in athletics and other after school activities. So, um, what, about about Wednesday? Wednesday? what about late start Wednesday? Do they still so have that? Our recommendation is to start every day at 8.45. So all five days, right? All so five days at 8.45. So uh, we are in ongoing conversations. Uh, the, the task force did not discuss the nature of the teacher workday. That is left for our collective bargaining conversations. And so we have recommendations to continue collaboration time in PLCs. We're not talking about eliminating PLCs, um, but we have not worked out through our collaborative bargaining the exact nature of which days of the week will be PLC and how those days will be structured. Um, if, sorry, Prentice, you're... Well, I mean, just let me, let me reinforce uh, that point. The actual teacher work day and what that likes, works like within the day is a collective bargaining issue. And uh, we are negotiating the contract this year, and that will be one of the things that we will be talking about. And we really can't say much more about that publicly. Uh, without uh, attempting to bargain the contract in public, which we can't do. So what that day looks like, um, you know, will be forthcoming <clears throat> as part of that discussion with uh, the teachers union, and that will be a good, healthy, vibrant, um, professional discussion, and as, it, as it always is. But it will incorporate our uh, current professional development for PLC, and we're hoping several other things that will be good for students. And as far as the task force members go, well, this was not within our purview to determine that. There, we certainly had conversations about the desirability of the classroom teachers in the room as well as the administrators in the room, the value and desirability of continuing teacher collaboration time. So um, as Prentice said, that those are questions that we did not attempt to answer, um, although we did you know, have conversations about values related to teacher collaboration. I'm guessing you also didn't really look at transportation issues in terms of getting, I mean, I know in the past we talked about how we couldn't change the start time because we shared the bus service with the later starting elementary district. We, we didn't do that through the task force, right. but, but we, we have yeah, had those conversations we and we've confirmed right. that with the bus yeah. company, yes. Yes, we no longer, uh, it's been several years yeah. since we shared buses. Um, the other thing this will do is both schools will 
follow the same schedule. So right now we're right now we are on a staggered schedule where Libertyville starts first and Vernon Hills goes second, and that is a leftover from years ago when we did share the buses with our two elementary districts and they had to make looping runs and then come back and you know get the high school kids or come back and get the elementary kids. Do you happen to know when all the feeder districts, like on top of your head, when they actually begin and when they're done? I've had conversations with them. Um, Highland, uh, I've worked with a group of cur the curriculum directors or assistants <coughs> at, uh, at the Sender schools and um, Highland already has a later start time. I think it's eight. 45, um, yeah, something, and, and uh, actually District 73 and some of the other districts have begun some conversations about middle school start times um, perhaps moving later. I, the elementary start a little bit earlier as well. But they are aware that we're having this conversation and they're supportive of the conversation. And Rita, other, other than the fact that it's 15 minutes earlier, or, or really what the question is, was that the real um, detractor from Schedule B because yes. I, I kind of look at it, I know it's only three minutes, but it's almost like having 11 fewer class periods per year per, per subject. Yeah. Which so there were seems, a lot, hard, seems yeah. a lot worse than three minutes when I, had, when I had it all up. Right. Um, so we, again, we talked about this at the um, task force as well. Um, and many of the educators, uh, t classroom teachers on the task force spoke for themselves and also talked to colleagues outside of the meetings and reported back uh, about that, did some informal polling and discussion. Um, there were several people in the room who as teachers, myself included, had transitioned for a time from a 50 minute period to a 45 minute period. And the, the responses uh, of those teachers were that we find ways to make efficiencies, right? We, we've moved recently from having Chromebooks on carts to every student yeah, having I their Chromebook. So the work distribution work. of Chromebooks at the beginning of the period and putting them back on the carts at the end, you know, could, could take several of these three minutes perhaps that we're talking about, right? So, um, well, the probably technology in general. Yep. Yeah, just kind of so speeds up your access to material. Quickly, everybody, uh, you're not printing materials. We've also, we looked at research related to instructional time and most often any studies that talk about the impact on student achievement are comparing what they call regular schedules to block schedules and they lump together anywhere from 45 to 55 minute periods in their study of regular schedules and they found no difference that can be documented that you know, one or the other has a more positive impact on student achievement. So um, there, there isn't much out there to suggest that the loss of a couple of minutes is going to have a profound impact on student achievement. There were concerns, and we heard our school board reps, and maybe we'll ask them too, about, you know, worries about if we have five fewer class, you know, five fewer minutes per class, does that mean that we'll have more work to do at home. I heard you say that that was one of the table talk conversations. Um, so um, members of the task force expressed that as well. And that was one of our talking points, again, about this balance issue. Make up those five minutes with efficiencies rather than with any kind of additional, you know, now you have five extra minutes to do X, Y, or Z at home. So I just want to be clear in understanding that what your, what the scientific and task force consensus is, is that starting 15 minutes later will outweigh, those health benefits associated with that will outweigh 16 minutes of less instructional time per day. Uh, so the task force is recommending the 8.45 start time versus an 8.30 start time. And yes, the preference, they expressed a strong preference to move from, especially at Vernon Hills, a start time that's already at 7.55 to recognize a difference for students and their ability to have a little bit more um, sleep at home. That the earlier you push it, if we're starting at 8.30, um, you know, what time are students actually getting to the bus? And when you look at the research, most of them say students, you know, should be sleeping until 8.30. Um, some recommendations say, you know, students shouldn't be starting till 10. We certainly didn't go to that extreme. Um, but, but the strong preference was that if students were to get a little bit more sleep at night um, or in, in the morning, um, that uh, pushing the start time to 8.45, um, like some area districts 
do, that that would um, result in the greatest benefit. There really is no research that says a 45 minute period versus a 50 minute period um, produces uh, declines in student achievement. Um, so is, is there is research that says students you know, should sleep as late as possible when they're in high school. What's the minimum number of minutes per period required by the state? Or the is state it? requires 300 minutes of class time per day, so not including lunch. lunch. So we, oh, we we're beyond that. We're beyond that. that. Right. We'll Can you all three oh five? I'm sorry, what does it come out to? 360. 360. 360. So we're, is our, we're, we're way beyond the required. Yeah. We are way beyond the required. Can you talk a little bit about um, benchmarking other districts in our areas relating to class time? Yeah, I think the, the, the district that I know of that starts at 845 and has the shortest um, instructional class period that we've studied is Nutrier. They have 40 minute class periods. Um, and uh, they start at 845 at one of their campuses. At HP. And at Highland Park, there were 42 minute class periods. Um, so, yeah. So many high achieving districts have periods years less years. than 50 minutes. Can I just ask a clarification? So, when you, what you said that the state requires a certain number, not including lunch. It, it, it requires 300 minutes of instructional time. Okay, but 360 um, includes lunch. No, no. no. Yeah, it's instructional. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. So we have oh, 300, right. we have 315 minutes oh, okay. above the width. Can we so change that? We should change so that. We probably got to change yeah. that. Yeah, good, good guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great, Carol. Okay. Just out of curiosity, I can't help myself here. What does Stevenson do uh, class wise? Their uh, class periods are 40. I think they, they were either 45 or 47. Okay. I'm not sure. All right. One and of the two. Again, just, just to summarize, for especially for people on tape, I mean, the plan is to cover the same material in a 45 minute class, right? At least for the year. If you cover 12 chapters of calculus this year, you're going to cover the same 12 chapters of calculus next year. I was an AP US teacher when I moved from a 50 minute period that was a construction um, project at the school I was teaching at, and we went from 50 minute periods to 45 minute periods for a year. And it required some adjustments, but um, you know, just anecdotally, my students performed as well on the AP exam in May that year that we had 45-minute periods. And, and overall, the entire district's AP scores were not impacted by that move from 45-minute to 50-minute periods. And again, I think that's what the research suggests. Um, okay. So uh, my only request would be that we consider, you know, after we've done this the first year or so, let's let, let's get some feedback. And how are the teachers doing? Are they able to get the material in? Is it going as smoothly as we said? Blah, blah. Right. And, and again, this, this, I'm sure is a, anyway. this is a recommendation of the task force. This is not, yeah, um, not that, right, that, you know, what we ultimately um, end up with in terms of minutes per period and the structure of the day is going to be something that um, we work out in processes beyond the task force recommendation as well. Boy, it sounds like Congress, doesn't it? Now we're going to negotiate. <laughs> So before you move on, so this is interesting on a by day basis, and you kind of said what Nutria does and everywhere else does. What's the total number of days the kids are in school? Because again, we have to look at the magnitude over a period of a year. Not, I mean, if Nutria kids go 190 in 45 we, we minutes, and we go. We actually have greater number of school days than is required by school code, um, and uh, that is not the practice in other area districts. So. Um, Years before I started, uh, Prentice can speak to this. Uh, the, the negotiations resulted in um, our teacher contract including a greater number of school days than is required by school code. So we have a, more instructional days than most districts do. Yeah, and again, I, correct. Yeah, and I, we've talked a little bit about that. I guess my only concern is if we ask for what does this look like against some benchmarks, which I did, we did hear the word benchmark. Uh, I think it's very important that we have the total number of instruction days in that benchmark as well, because I, I think the concern comes into, if you look at the totality of it, 16 minutes or however many minutes a day doesn't sound like a lot, but over 180 days, it, it comes up to the 50 hours or 60 hours of less, less instruction time. And again, I, the study <coughs> you said tell the story, sure. but... But every, every experience is different. We understand that, and you know, the, the, there certainly isn't consensus um, 
complete consensus on the task force, and I imagine, you know, as, as conversations continue, there will be varied opinions about this as well. But the the task force was really clear about this idea that rather than losing instructional minutes, efficiencies can be found at the start and end of periods to maximize the time available in the class period. And um, you know, we have a very professional teaching staff, and if this were the schedule that we were to adopt. Our teachers, I am quite confident, would ensure that our students are as, sex, as, as successful as they presently are by finding ways to be a little bit more efficient in, in how they begin and end their classes. I, I got two things. For One for you four. Do any of you support 8.30 over 8.45? Okay. No Secondly, <laughs> uh, Rita, if you uh, one request I have is sure. I'd be interested to hear someone that supported the earlier um, start time their justification yeah. for doing so. Yeah, and that's I was going to talk about that when we move Perfect. to this next uh, slide. So um, th there were, uh, and I will say, a couple of members of the task force who felt strongly about this particular um, schedule moving to a 47 minute class period, which is one minute difference than our current 48 minutes. And for them, the primary concern was less change in instructional time. Um, they, I said the vast majority, were concerned about starting as late as we could to provide students with the requisite sleep time for a couple of members preserving 47 versus 45 minutes was their primary concern, and that's why this schedule was discussed. And that, that was really the only reason that they uh, spoke to in support of this, is that for them that 47 minutes was very important. If they recognized that if, it were, if we were to retain 50 minutes currently, that we'd have students here till very late in the day, and all after school uh, activities would be impacted. So. Um, Starting at 8.30, retaining the 47 minutes was their way to kind of be closer to what we presently have. So do you think the core members of that group are made up of that <coughs> then? Um, most, of the, uh, most of the educators in the room supported the first schedule okay. that we discussed. Um, and several of the educators in the room, and, and again, this, when we put out the call for task force members, it went out to our entire staff. It was open to everyone. The assumption was that we would get members who wanted to keep things just the way they were, and maybe we'd get some members who liked this idea of a later start time, but very quickly consensus developed that everyone on the task force was in favor of moving the, late, the start time to later. So, you know, we could have had task force members who chose to join because they support the issue, but when you put out an open call for committee work, you hope that you find uh, educators and others to join because they have differing opinions. So um, we did our best to make sure that we had all opinions represented on the task force. And just real quick, the passing period right now is five minutes. Yes, five minutes. Same and as same as everything. There was conversation about could we limit that to four minutes, and it was just deemed impossible, especially by the kids on the, the students on the task force who said, we just can't make it, it's a struggle you already. <laughs> five minutes is barely enough. I'm sure you guys will yeah. concur with that yeah. or LHS. We, we also looked at, do we get rid of the five minute uh, announcements that are attached to one period? And there was a strong sentiment for keeping that. It's a way to keep mm -hmm. the community informed and students appreciate the information they get during those announcements. And so we really did have deep conversations about everything that we're recommending to you tonight. And again, it, this represents the findings of this group of 35 people. Um, and, and so. We'll, we'll do work beyond this to see where we end up. So just a couple things for me. Number one, sure. really appreciate the work that you and, and everybody you've put into this. Um, you know, it's, it's the right direction in which to move. Um, I think, uh, you know, if I have two, two just recommendations on my, on my own, you know, number one is this gets more widely, you know, what's out there, people are gonna see it. Um, it's going to be in the board meeting highlights. Um, I see we have our two school newspapers uh, that are covering this today because, you know, you guys aren't even going to experience this. You're like graduating, Rachel. So, 
you know, <clears throat> but it, it's going to be out there. And people are going to be kind of intrigued by it, excited about it, whatever. And so, you know, I'm looking, Mary. So communication as this goes out. I mean, my first thought when I started looking at this, the zero hour, I forgot about it. And I think people need to be re-educated because some people don't have the labs and they're like, well, you're going to do alternative classes. I think you just need to say today, we already have early bird and zero hour, John, whatever you call them. So to make sure, no, this is nothing new. This is what we do with our labs today. So kids are, you know, are, have a certain amount of kids doing gym at 7 a.m. So explain it that way. And two, you know, not everything to me is about benchmarking. You do this because they do it and you do it. But I think maybe the most anxiety, I think what you've heard from a lot of people, boy, are we really losing something and going from 50 to 45? Or do we feel more comfortable with 47? I'm hearing that we're already 50 way above everybody else. 45, we may be on par or even still. It may be worthy to put that benchmarking data out there, some of some comparables that we always look at. You heard some of the schools that were brought up looking at the class size, but also the days. Just so, hey, you know, we're not doing something that's way wacky out there. Other people have done this in their very successful institutions and, and so forth, just so people have that idea that this isn't way off the reservation of what is being recommended. Sure. And those are the schedules that the task force reviewed. We just we did not it just might be worth I, I know as a school sure. board member when we get questions, <clears throat> I would like to someone said, Oh my gosh, say, well hey, here's what they benchmarked against and you'll be surprised these other folks, you know, we're still way ahead of the game if that's the case. But I think that would be helpful. When you talk about neutral being at forty, neutral yeah. has kind of historically been the benchmark. Yeah. Stevenson more recently, you know, over the last quarter century um, has really been there a bit. Um, when you look at those two times and then what they're doing at Highland Park Deerfield are two phenomenal high schools. So to your point, I think that's really important, but I, I, do, want, but I do want to interject something again. <coughs> the length of the time periods is a contractual issue. Okay, so at the end of the day, that has to go through a negotiation process. So um, we don't have the ability, their task was to make a recommendation then the length of the periods and the workday are part of the negotiations with the teachers' union. So we just, we just have to keep that in mind as we go through uh, the process. Now, everything that we've talked about tonight has been great discussion, uh, and it's very important for us to consider as we have the opportunity to go in and have that conversation with the union about what the day looks like. Absolutely. So. Yeah. And we need to make that point, point as well too, Scott. I mean, with everyone, that this is a recommendation, but there are you know substantive pieces of this that are um, subject to collective, collective bargaining that we will have to uh, have a conversation with uh, the union about and, and work together with them to um, make a final decision, I guess you might say. We concluded the task force with that. We started and concluded it with the understanding that as a task force, we had, the, we had the authority to make a recommendation. We didn't have the authority to ensure its implementation, that that would there's, go beyond us. To your point, there's pieces of that that need to come together yes. for any of this to get finalized. Yes. But all the things that we've talked about tonight are germane and they're important, including benchmarking, uh, in terms of looking at which the group has done some of it, and you heard a little bit about that. Uh, but just to take the next step with that and formalize it a little bit more is, is not a problem uh, because at the end of the day, we would want to share that information as part of any final, you know, decision. Could you either, you know, as we mentioned on the um, instructional minutes per day, either say that that includes lunch or take out lunch? Yeah, we need sure. to take out yeah, lunch. Yeah, we can, we can yeah. do that, yeah. Um, sure. So, you know, school code uh, does not include lunch, but we do have, we, school code does not include lunch in our count of instructional minutes, but one of the reasons that we left it in this report is that, unfortunately, we do have some students who right. take classes eight periods a day and uh, are involved in things, you know, that they don't take time out for their... So you said Stevenson has 40 in uh, 47 at Stevenson and uh, 40 at New Trier. So in 40, how many classes would they take? Because that would put them under the... Say, they have a nine period day. Okay, so they have, they have one more period, right? Yeah. Okay. So, they're, so they're fitting they more things into their... Right, I just, yeah. Okay. It, you just, when you're comparing 
capital sales. Seems like right. how could they do that if they don't have it? Exactly. And yeah, it falls below the state requirements. Which right. So some Districts students, also can bank time. Some students aren't taking lunch. Um, Correct. Some kids eat in their classroom. Some some students have you know a science lab maybe for half of their lunch or are booked up in other ways that um, you know they're they're a bit overscheduled and so. That's. I guess that's another discussion, but to me that just seems kind of contradictory to the, what we're trying to do here with health and wellness. Yeah. But and that's why that's why this, the task force felt really strongly about you know it's not just about the start and end of the school day; it's about these other issues of balance that again the task force couldn't solve, but mm -hmm. very much wanted to <coughs> comment on and make recommendations about. Just one yeah, response. To to John, go ahead. It's yeah. important, John. Go ahead. Just one response to that. We have credit limits for yeah. students, so they cannot. So a student that doesn't. Can you think of a kid that doesn't take lunch? It's probably because they're doing something like a chamber choir, in non-credit bearing, elective in nature. They have credit limits, so they have to have a free period, and almost every kid takes a lunch right there. But there are very few instances where a kid will not take a lunch because they're doing something elective non-credit. So the student and the parents have made a decision for them to take something else. And one other thing, just to your lunch at Vernon Hills, I, we have half period lunches. Yeah. So you would only take half of a period off of those instructional minutes. Where did you do the other half? Study hall. And study hall, the school code does allow, as long as you are in a study hall that's supervised by um, a support staff member or an educator, that does count in your total instructional minutes. And just to be clear, my understanding is, John, they do that because your cafeteria is so small. That's exactly right. But, but that's that not that your ability, though. Well, thank you. That's a good lead into a January discussion that we're going to have <laughs> <laughs> about space yeah. and yeah. I, will good say, I will say that in this discussion of balance as well, we had a lot of conversations about what works for one student doesn't necessarily work for every student, mm -hmm. and that we are very good at uh, recognizing and understanding the whole child and working with individual students. Um, to um, help them achieve their goals and their family goals while recommending this balance. So I think we do a really good job, and our recommendation was just that we continue that, that we have these conversations, we make recommendations, but ultimately, um, in, in many ways, we support that flexibility and decision-making for students and their parents in our communities. And also something, just looking at the numbers, what you quoted on people going to early bird or Zero period. I mean, <coughs> some like ninety-five percent, roughly, of the students we have are within a normal school hour, so they would start. I mean, no matter what we do, there's always somebody in the fringes, right? So, I wouldn't want to get overly concerned that we're pushing them that hard if it's that five percent, because you know they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. So, uh, Rita, first of all, thank you for your uh, facilitation and leadership with the group. Uh, you, as well as some others, but you, there always has to be somebody that, facil people on that, that facilitates the process, and you're always very humble, so we appreciate your work with a very uh, diverse uh, group of stakeholders uh, in the district. You all have done uh, phenomenal work. Um, great thought, looking at research, you've taken us beyond. Uh, the schedule to look, uh, again, to keep that conversation about balance alive. Uh, and our goal, hopefully at the end, we'll be able to be in a position through our recommendation administratively, our conversation with the teachers union, uh, to be able to implement a later start schedule in 2018-19. So we're hoping that's the uh, that, that, that that's Task force members asked me to put that, make sure that was part of the right. presentation as well. So. Yeah, so we're done. Yeah, that's a good job. Thank you. <coughs> right, great job. Okay, any last questions for Rita? I'm sorry, I kind of closed this off without asking you that. Okay. All right, uh, great. Thank you, Rita. Excellent. Okay, um, we have uh, one donation acknowledgement tonight, and this is for. Um, uh, Bart um, Spigner, who uh, lives in Vernon Hills, we want to acknowledge uh, receipt of a generous donation on October 20, 2017 of the following items to Vernon Hills High School for the use by students and staff who are involved in the production of the annual yearbook. Uh, first, Canon number 40 DEOS -E camera body, uh, one Canon 50 millimeter 1.4 EF VSM lens. Uh, that sounds pretty impressive to me. Uh, one Sigma 18-2000 uh, millimeter 3.5 uh, 
uh, to three, 6.3 lens, uh, four memory cards, rechargeable batteries, charge uh, and cases, and five light stands, extension cords, light shields, bulbs, cases, and containers. So a pretty extensive donation uh, to Vernon Hills High School. So we want to thank uh, Ms. Spigner for that. Um, and last on the superintendent's report tonight, we had two FOIA requests since we met last time. Uh, we had uh, first request we received on 11-8-2017 uh, from Salima Griffin from Sheet Metal Works in Arlington Heights. They requested HVAC contractor for the LHS Aquatic Center project located uh, at uh, 708 West Park Avenue in Libertyville, which is the address of the high school. Uh, Follow-up responsibility on this request was Dan, um, and uh, response <coughs> date was 12-6-17, uh, and the deadline was 12-7-17. Uh, the second request was from John Lampinen, Senior VP slash Editor of Paddock Publications. Um, he requested annual written request for notice of meetings covering the calendar year uh, 2017 or, or 2018. And of course, that is accessible on the website. Uh, Follow-up responsibility was uh, Denise, and uh, our response deadline was 12:13, and we responded on 12:7. So those are our two requests for this month. And Pat, with that, the superintendent's report is concluded. All right, good job, thank you. All right, next, the consent vote agenda is listed. We reviewed it earlier this evening. If I could ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda is listed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just one question. I, I think this may be in there, and it's just regarding one of the bills we paid, Dan. Gil Bain, you want to, I think it's like in the 300, no, 400,000. Yeah, yeah. yeah, could you just briefly go over what that was for? Yeah, it'll be one of many bills to come from Gil Bain because they're managing the project. So uh, the, the relationship with, with Gil Bain is to be construction manager at risk. So they actually hold all the contracts. Uh, so the board approves them and then they assign them over to Gil Bain. Um, and so Gil Bain then collects all the money and pays all the trades. Uh, so what you'll see is you'll, you'll probably see every month a, Gil Bain, a bill for Gil Bain, but that doesn't mean that's just Gil Bain's fee or anything. That, that's really for the trade. So out of the 430-ish thousand dollars that's there, you're talking 400,000, almost nearly 400,000 of that is gonna be in the trade. So about 360 is the actual trades, and then there's other fees associated with that that are gonna be related to Gil Bain. So the vast majority of those bills are you're gonna see are from the trades. And then the bigger part of the trades is gonna be for burger excavating for a lot of the, the digging that you're gonna see in the tree removal and the, and the site development, so. Great, thank you. Yeah, Very good question, Kevin. All right, is there a motion to approve the consent vote agenda? I move to uh, approve the consent vote agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Not roll call, please. Batson? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. All right, motion carries. Um, program and personnel, um, Chairperson Maurer. Okay, we have policies to go over for a first reading, um, 10 of them. All right, first policy, policy 2260 Uniform Grievance Procedure. This simply adds <coughs> breastfeeding accommodations for students to the list of rights that are guaranteed by our state and federal government. Um, we have policy 415, identity protection. There are provisions in there regarding the requirements of the Identity Protection Act and those were added to the policy for clarification purposes. The policy 4170 safety, that policy was revised to more thoroughly detail compliance and reporting requirements of the Safety Drill Act. So although we do more, we do the required drills, this spells it out a little bit better. Um, policy 5290, employment termination and suspensions. Um, that policy was updated to include language about the steps that the district takes when it receives a recommendation from DCF regarding an employee. And I just want to put in that typically when this happens, DCF, we, the district's usually taken all of the steps first and then DCF comes along. Yeah, I've not, in my experience, had it be the other way around, but just wanted to add that in there. Um, Policy 6150, Home and Hospital Instruction, that policy is updated to reflect that physician's assistants and advanced practitioner, practice nurses may also provide written permission for home or hospital instruction that adds it to the list of physicians and other approved providers. 
um, policy 715, student and family privacy rights. That policy takes away the use of the term ward and it updates, it's updated to include the student's parents and guardians' ability to inspect surveys or evaluations upon requests. We have policy 720, harassment of students prohibited. Um, that is updated with new names and new titles. So we have non-discrimination coordinators and we have complaint managers. Um, that policy was, up, was updated um, due to the Illinois school code that requires school personnel to be available for help with a bully or to make a report about bullying and have that be made known to school personnel and parents. Policy 770, attendance and truancy. That policy adds language that allows a student to be excused from attendance at a school whose parent or guardian is on active military duty. Uh, policy 7180, prevention of and response to bullying, intimidation, and harassment. Again, that policy is updated to reflect the same language changes that we talked about in harassment of students prohibited. So um, non-discrimination coordinators, complaint managers, change of names. Um, and finally, set up policy 7305, student athlete concussions and head injuries. And again, that adds language um, to, to have advanced practice registered nurses and physicians assistants um, also being able to provide written excuses in addition to physicians and other approved providers. Questions? Anything? All right, so we're looking for um, a motion to approve. No, we're just going to do it. Sorry. Just the first. We have a motion to do Okay. So then that, can, that concludes the report unless anybody wants to further discuss it. All right. Thank you. Facilities and Finance, Chair Burton Batson. Thank you, Dr. Grudy. We have one item here for action item uh, resolution to designate preparation of tentative budget for FY 2019. It's upon us already. And Jim, I would just note uh, for the record, and Dan can comment on this, that um, we're just acknowledging that we always start in the middle of the year in terms of doing the budget. And so this just acknowledges that rather than doing it in yeah. March or April or May, uh, it, you know, as we have officially before. What is our assumption for the state budget or the budget for next year? Is it status quo at the state level or? With all the stuff that's going on, or uh, no, for our budget, what is our assumption relating to the state budget and everything that's going on in Springfield? I'm assuming it's status quo. Uh, well, I mean, this year. 18 or 19? This is next year's budget. Well, they, they'll have to yeah. vote on that budget. Yeah, there is no budget, year, but I mean, my working no budget for FY the next year. Yeah, yeah. my working assumption would just kind of start from basically what we're getting this year, which is what we're getting last year based on the new evidence based funding model. Um, and I'm not really going to assume more money from the state. No, I'm not assuming more. I'm worried more about less. We'll, well take a look. Uh, we might actually have a bump this year because of. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking of the freeze property taxes and things like that. Well, that would be that would be dependent on what comes down in the spring session uh, with an election a year away from April. Yeah. So, but is there? There's no forecasting on that right now. Yeah. Okay. So where we're going to have. So when they get down there, we're going to have a better idea of where the po political agenda, if anything, is going to happen. Um, you know, uh, the alternative could happen, and that means it's an election year, so nothing gets done. That's more, uh, that's usually very common at, at the federal level, and it's also common at the state level. So um, we're going to have to see what they anchor in on when they get back down there in the spring, and then we're going to have to work with legislators and do what we do to connect to the, the process there and, and okay. see how we can make sure our voice is heard. Okay. And I'd say ultimately whatever stage we're at in the budgeting process, it'll be using the most current information we have available and with kind of if we know have a sense that something's coming down the pike of kind of like, you know, kind of doing a 1B version that would assume, you know, what would that impact be and kind of being aware of that. Yeah. But like for example, we make our staffing decisions in spring. March. Yeah, that's why I'm asking, because yep. what, what you're saying is by the time they're back in session, it'll almost be too late for us to really do anything. Well, it, it always is, and we've had that conversation, and remember, um, we have to do our staffing then, right. because by state law, we have notification deadlines for uh, tenured and non-tenured employees, and if we miss those uh, notification deadlines, um, and uh, we are not hiring a position back or a person back, 
Um, they have a contract for the following oh, year. So really, I, I know, yeah, you do. Uh, but just for the public again, um, the budget cycle, the state's budget cycle, uh, to Pat's point, did not line up with the actual staffing, which drives 70% of the cost of our budget. So anything that happens in the spring session is usually after staffing, uh, because it runs all the way out to May. So whether it's a state budget, it's a decision on property, uh, tax freeze, it's a pension cost shift, uh, whatever it might be is going to happen after uh, we've gone through a process that we're legally required to do by the state, which drives 70% 70, 70 of our, at least, of our budget costs. So it doesn't sync up, um, you know, real well. But Pat, to your earlier question, there is no, we, there is a state budget in place that was uh, the governor vetoed and then was overridden for this year. So FY18, there is no state budget for FY19 that will have to be debated and decided in the spring session with the heat of a political campaign approaching us. So um, it should be an interesting spring in Springfield, I think. Okay, so Jim, was there a motion? So this is no, we need a motion, and it's just starting the process. We're just beginning yeah, yeah, our budget process. So we need a motion. I move to begin and accept the budget process going forward. Second. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Dan, is that what you need to go forward? Is that the resolution you need? Yep. You're looking for? Okay. okay. Uh, hearing no questions, uh, roll call, please. Rudy? Aye. Hubert? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Thurman? Aye. Batson? Aye. Aye. Okay. And that concludes facilities. <coughs> okay, thank you. No property, no CEDAW, no ISB, so um, that's it. Can I have a motion to uh, convene an executive session on topic employee, employment of an employee, uh, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C1? Second. Any discussion? If not, roll call, please. Huber. Aye. Luke. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Maurer. Aye. Thurman. Aye. Batson. Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries. Thanks. Good night, everybody.